Buenos días o buenas good morning, tardes. Or good afternoon. Welcome everyone to this session, which is part of the Zero Project 2021 Recording Employment and IT ICTs for Latin America. It is a pleasure. My name is Ricardo Garcia Bamonde. I am consultant for accessibility and I've been working on this from 2004 in the area of the inclusion of people with disabilities, accessibility to digital technologies. And it's a pleasure to moderate this session regarding technologies, avant-garde technologies for inclusion. In this panel, we are going to be talking about emerging technologies or avant-garde cutting edge technologies that may help and are already helping people with disabilities in order to have a better integration in society, in order to have a better and greater presence and incorporation in society. And of course, these are technologies that we may know of, that we are familiarized with, and there are some that we don't know a lot of. So we are going to go over the technologies and we are going to talk about practical examples and cases that would show us how the technologies are being put in place by some people, by some organizations with very important and very interesting examples. And for that, we have a very good panel of experts that will join us throughout the session and will be sharing with us the case studies, as I said it earlier. First of all, we have Sakim Saeed, who is software, actually the manager of uh, software engineering for Microsoft. And also he is the person that is leading the project Seeing Eye AI that is sort of looking through artificial intelligence. And we also have with us Raul Moreno, who is the head or the leader responsible for strategic projects in Netherlands, and also commercial director for Nelsys Tech for many years now. And Raul is an engineer in IT, and he also has a master's and MBA by the European School of Business, and he works developing this program, which is a program for strategic partnerships for the technologies that he will be sharing with us in this case in order to achieve that tourism and public transportation is more accessible for everyone. So this is a technology of digital science for everyone. And we also have Haisiel Madrid Sanchez who is an engineer in telecommunications. He has studies in artificial intelligence by the University Carlos III from Madrid. And from 2019, he is a digital manager and director of Interiors Living Lab, who is a cluster of uh, home appliances and home contracts in Catalonia. And he has developed his career around the research and consulting on innovation, social innovation in the digital area. Of course, leading over 40 projects, both nationally and internationally along his career. And he has received a number of awards and acknowledgements, for instance, the Buffon Award for Innovation in Telecommunication. So having this very good panel, I think that we are going to be able to offer a very good and comprehensive view regarding how the new technologies are actually helping and making a contribution and helping us taking a lead in some countries, of course, not all of them, but for that, we are going to try to explore how to achieve that, how the technologies can be incorporated into different 
scopes of actions, not only in different geographies, in different um, areas. And before that, I think it's important that we go over or that at least we give an overview regarding what do we mean when we talk about innovative technologies or emerging technologies. So we could say that emerging technologies are those technologies that in their development and practical applications have not been uh, fulfilled yet. They are at an early stage and they present some sort of novelty in their application, especially in their application, not so much in their conception. And they usually go through a very quick growth at a very fast pace and they have a huge impact over their scope of application but they can also generate uncertainty and ambiguity up to a certain extent and we will see why so we could say that this is technology which is a radically new of a very fast growth that has consistency a long time and that has a huge potential to general changes in society or in different socioeconomic aspects of it and that it can be used by different stakeholders or different institutions and it can be used in different manners individually or by different groups of individuals and it can use or help of course that the production means are very positively impacted and we usually believe that the impact will be seen in the future and that is what generates uncertainty in how things will be applied in the future for instance we may say that the european forum the european disability forum which is based on brussels in belgium has defined these emerging technologies or innovative technologies as avant-garde technologies technologies that are relatively new of a very fast development with the potential of having a positive impact over people and societies within a time frame of five to ten years so there are technologies that we have seen that have come up that have been very innovative that have disappeared and there are technologies that after many years they may have not reached yet the right degree of maturity now what are some examples of uh, technologies that innovate that for many of us we believe that have been uh, in place for a long time first of all artificial intelligence which is applied in so many different scopes of action for instance for household entertainment and also entertainment overall for instance in on board planes if we've been on a plane we've seen the screens the touch screens that we have uh, before ourselves and all the possibilities of entertainment uh, that they offer the passengers also video conference systems of course we have all or at least many of us most of the population that has been on lockdown they have become familiarized luckily or unfortunately with video conference systems like zoom like teams or many other systems that we are using at the moment for this very conference and they have been key in order to maintain communication both in the family scope and also in the professional and work environment in order to provide a certain sense of continuity to our daily activities during this time of pandemic and lockdown that we have gone through in the world this is a technology which was considered an innovation in the last years but now it has been key and it continues to be key just like all the technologies that have been added on top of this for instance at this moment i'd like to mention that together with the video conference systems that not so many people are using there have been different uh, systems that have been put on top of this for instance artificial intelligence systems in order to do real time subtitles of everything that is going on real time subtitles based on artificial intelligence that are linked or put on top of video conference systems these are huge innovations these are a huge leap in a very short period of time of course there are other technologies like extended reality and that would include virtual reality we have all seen at some point the virtual reality goggles that put 
us in virtual worlds that have been created by computers that little by little allow us to generate simulations of things that otherwise it would be impossible, impossible to do. And also we have augmented reality, which is sort of a way of receiving more information, which is overlapping to what we see at the moment, and mixed reality, which is a mix of both with layers that are added on top. And with that, the experience overall is highly immersive and the amount of information and the feelings that sensations that we get are actually amazing. They are highly valuable for certain areas, for instance, education, cognitive stimulation, etc., etc. Also, it is very important, and maybe Isiel and Raul will touch on this later on and comment on this, would be the digital user interfaces and everything that has to do with more than households, actually indoors, smart indoors, the Internet of Things, as many of you know, more and more they are being put in place small devices that can be connected to the internet in order to capture information and all that information can be turned into a number of systems or databases and at the same time that information can be used in order to improve our life or to make a system more um, or better functioning and that is the internet of things and now we have the web of things with devices that are connected to the internet and we are moving on to the web of things that are small leaps or big leaps that are happening let's not even talk about self-driven vehicles as we can see they include for instance a vision for or with artificial intelligence, also driving with artificial intelligence, using maps, and also the possibility of adding layers of virtual reality, augmented reality for the passengers in the vehicle. And with that, there's a number of technologies, just to name a few of them, that actually offer you the promise of a better life. And in the case of people with disabilities, and especially elderly people, we are going to be more and more in time, of course, with the aging of the population. And with that, we have to pay attention to the disabilities that may appear, which is a natural process that will affect all of us uh, throughout our lives, right? Uh, God willing. And all the technologies uh, offer us the promise of improving our future quality of life in all the different aspects of our lives of course, to maintain our autonomy, our inclusion, and to help people with disabilities throughout their activities in their lives. Now, for all the technologies to actually fulfill that promise, it's very important that the technologies are at the service of people. And this is where we hear the concept of accessibility so for you to be able to use an interface for instance in a computer like i'm doing it right now in a mobile device like this one for instance or in any other device that may have an interface that allows me to sort of interact with it that interface that device needs to be created in a way in which i'm able to interact with that now, this is from the functional perspective, this is accessibility. And what is that linked to as well? It is linked to the countries having regulations or regulatory frameworks and also certain standards in place that allow all new services, products, by the government or by the private sector that are made available for citizens, commercially or not, so that they can actually be used by all the citizens, by all people. Why is that? Because there needs to be a number of legislations or regulations that that require for that to be the case. Because otherwise, what happens? Many people will just not have access to the products. People with disabilities, they will not have access, for instance, to the services of digital government where all the technologies can be included at the end of the day if they're not they end up being our 
they end up excluding certain groups of people and that is what we are trying to avoid and for that there needs to be a certain level of consistency between the technological progress and the regulatory framework that needs to be in place in a country or in a region overall having said that if we're talking just as an example before we move on to the panel members if we think about something like video games for instance video games are highly popular this is a sector within leisure which is very important in terms of uh, the generation of wealth and it is now beyond the entire audiovisual sector it is beyond the film and tv industry and it only continues to grow exponentially and the number of players at a world level has increased exponentially as well but accessibility has not improved in the same manner even though it is improving accessibility for uh, video games and emerging technologies that are being applied to video games for instance virtual reality or real-time communication through voice or through subtitles with a voice to text ability or capability and for instance maybe touch systems or systems to follow the movement of your eyes and with all the, these technologies it would be possible for all people even people with certain functional disabilities to have access to video games but the companies that develop the video games they actually have to put all of those layers of or elements of accessibility there in place for this to actually be available for everyone now what can we say for instance about augmented reality we've all heard about pokemon go lately now it's not trending as it was but it was based on augmented reality and now different improvements have been put in place so that people with disabilities were able to use such a popular game because i would say hundreds of millions of people in the world were using it and they were enjoying it so much and that would be just one example of how to apply disruptive technologies uh, for this to be available for everyone so a game just like uh, pokemon go so that augmented reality can help it be readily available for everyone we can also talk about or for instance when we talk about the population we are talking about uh, millions of users for instance garner said that by 2020 there were going to be 100 million of people that were going to be using augmented reality systems or for instance that by 2025 500 million units of the augmented reality devices will be sold all over the world and the forecasts may even be falling short just like the trends are moving along in the latest months similar to internet connected uh, vehicles there were forecast saying that 90 percent of the vehicles were going to be connected to the internet up to uh, 2020 but it is believed that they will be in the future for the benefit of all the users and we know that all the emerging technologies may have an impact and they may be a high, they may have a huge impact over the education of uh, children for instance we know that 40 percent of the population will grow old and there are countries where the population of children continues to grow and those children it's possible that they have issues to have access to formal education and many of them with disabilities may not have access to certain uh, technologies because of covid and now with covid the video conference systems are being used more and more and also online distance education is more popular and we know that all the technologies have to be made available so that children and everyone with functional disabilities or any disability is able to use the technologies so we know that there are a number of issues with the subtitles of the classes for instance for what the teachers are saying and other classmates are saying so that all the interventions of the teachers to be um, having or to be put 
on the screen so that children with learning disabilities find it easier to follow the class so that also all the digital contents documents videos they have to have subtitles of course so that every person who is deaf or everyone in general of course may use this during the class with artificial intelligence which allows for that and with this it needs to happen but for this the schools and the educational systems overall have to be aware of the possibilities that are out there and that apply them and if there is a regulation in the country that regulates this of course everything will be so much more simple and of course we could continue on and on for many hours but since we have a limited amount of time at this moment i'm going to now give the floor to my colleagues and the members of the panel that are joining us today in this session and i'm going to start with the first person that we have with our panel in this case we have with us we have sakib shahid from Microsoft, like I said it earlier, he is the person that leads the Seeing AI project. And I'm going to give the floor to this panel member at this moment for him to share with us the project, the highly innovative technology that has to do with how artificial intelligence help people with a visual disability to move around their environment in different in different areas of their lives and also how this can be scaled up. And with that, Sakib, please, the floor is yours. And welcome to the session. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today and speaking to you. So I've been interested in the possibility of technology to improve people's lives ever since I was a child. This idea that technology can level the playing field and enable all of us to realize what we are capable of even if the environment or situation in which we are does not allow it. So for me, this became apparent as a child who was blind. I remember the very first day that I was taught to use a computer that could speak to me. And this possibility that I could sit at a computer and write a document or send an email, just the same one else. And the other person would have no idea that, the, that I was blind. For me, this was a magical moment. And as a child, it set me off on this adventure of learning more about technology and the transformative capability it has to improve people's lives. As I progressed through university, I heard of more and more situations where engineers and scientists who could create new solutions would work with people with disabilities and create inventions which became the things that me and other people with disabilities relied on that could as i said level the playing field enable us all to do more that was a powerful idea that stayed with me as i started my career and joined microsoft and some years into my career, I was working on many different products, many different solutions, but I remembered those early days. And as I saw more and more emerging technologies being created, like artificial intelligence, I realized that I wanted to be a part of this. I wanted to start creating my own technologies for people with disabilities to empower people to do more. I have this idea here, this vision that one day we will all have assistive agents which will help us interact with the environment 
in whatever way is best for us. For me, as someone who's blind, I want a little friend, pretend, metaphorical, sitting on my shoulder, whispering on my ear, telling me what's around me, just like I would when I'm with a friend or a relative who is guiding me. And for someone who is hard of hearing, we have real-time translation now and visualizations to show audio sound or AI that can hear for us. So really, AI is learning to see, it's learning to hear. And while we are very early on, AI is increasing at an ever faster pace. And so this is what set me on this journey to look at how can artificial intelligence empower people with disabilities to do more. And in particular, we came up with the Seeing AI project, where we are looking at how can latest technologies help someone who is blind or has low vision in their daily lives. I think of this as a conversation. We can't do this just in isolation, but it's a conversation between the blind community and the scientists and engineers in my team at Microsoft. We find out what are those challenges in life and how can we use AI and other technologies to solve those challenges. And while we still have a long way to go, I'd like to share a bit about what seeing AI is today. And we have a short video to explain how one of our users is incorporating seeing AI into so many parts of his daily life. So let's watch that video. Mi filosofía es que hay que aprovechar la vida. My philosophy is that you have to uh, reap what you sow, take advantage of life. Family and music are critical in my life. Technology allows me to do my own thing. I try to be as autonomous as possible, and for that purpose, I use low technology such as this white cane and high technology like my uh, smartphone. Seeing AI is one of the best technological options there is for users with visual impairment. It's uh, an app where you can read almost uh, all the elements that are everywhere. It has different functions that collaborate and use things that you may use when you need them. It's the technological equivalent of uh, something that is multi-use. Out of all the functions of seeing AI, I think that uh, this Northwest has, uh, this would change my life. I don't know if, if any other app that has any functions like this. When I'm on a bus or a taxi, I'd like to uh, see where I'm going with my app. What I love of short text is if I'm alone at home, I can know who the mail is for. So I don't open my wife's mail and she's not uh, mad at me. Hi, Alex, how are you? 20 pounds, wow. This is quite useful because sometimes it's hard for me to distinguish one bill from the other. And if I touch them, I distinguish, I can't distinguish immediately. So this app helps me. Scene is a very descriptive function. I think it's impressive. In my view, one of the best parts of seeing AI is the capacity of uh, having images and seeing images from social networks because people normally send me pictures with that. So I share with uh, I share with them and I obtain a description of the image when they share images with me. My perception of social media has changed. Now I feel like I can participate much more than before. The effect, the effect of having seeing AI on hand all the time is like taking in your pocket someone that's uh, seeing. Now I can do many more things I couldn't do before. I think that seeing AI is a technological step into the right uh, direction, and I hope we continue going towards that direction for many years.
Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really an amazing technology, the one that you are developing from Microsoft. And I think that this is going to be great for the improvement of everything that we're doing in terms of inclusion for people with disabilities and also to be able to create new possibilities based on your technology. So uh, the future is really promising. Thank you very much. So. Um, now we are going to give the floor to the next expert that we have in our plan panel today, uh, Raul Moreno from Navilens. So Raul, please go ahead with your presentation. We are very anxious to get to know a little bit more about uh, Navilens and everything that you are promising. So thank you very much. Go ahead. Gracias, Ricardo, por, por esta introducción y sobre todo. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for this introduction, and thank you very much for uh, to the Scudeme Foundation to count on us for this talk. So I am Raúl Moreno from Navilens. We are a Spanish company, a, a Spanish startup, and we work to empower people with visual disability. First of all, I want to um, apologize for uh, with the interpreters if I speak too fast. I try to do it as fast as possible and as agile as possible. So I want to tell to tell you that in the world there are uh, there are about 300 million people uh, with disabilities and about 40 million uh, are uh, blind. People with visual impairments are not independent in unknown places because they have limitations to get to know the signage. So we had an idea and we thought about how we could deal with this challenge. We thought that we could do something. We could put something in the science uh, to help people with visual impairments to find those things just with their mobile phones. So we started working with QRs, uh, but as you know, the QR codes can be only read uh, close to the sign, so it's not easy for a, a visually impaired person. So we had to be uh, researching for five years, um, working on innovation, creating something totally different. And we created this Navalence code that can be read up to 12 meters uh, distance in a very fast way without uh, having to focus on, on the queue, on, on this Navalence um, code. This can be read with up to an 80 degree angle in each one of, of the sites we are able to check it, you can download Navilens Go. It's um, available for you to download it. The first time that we introduced this was in a fair, and uh, we uh, were able for people with visual impairments to identify the different stands. It was incredible. It was an amazing experience for everyone, for them and for us. Netherlands is really a, a reality right now in the United Kingdom, in Iceland, and we're in the, in, in the US, they have included our codes. So we are starting in uh, public transportation. This is in Barcelona and uh, the GPS was not uh, precise enough, but we are going to start seeing how we can solve this problem. So where's the bus stop? With Navilens, uh, a visually impaired person only needs to uh, open up the app and uh, scan around. Como veis, as you can see, I get the information in real time and they also give me my position. So if I am displaced, if I am uh, far away, or if I uh, get closer, it's going to help me to get to the right position. This allows the person with a visual impairment to find the element that uh, bus stop or whatever they are needing and get real time information. With Navalence Go, any user can scan the code and can get this information. And Navalence uh, speaks 33 different languages. So I have to, <laughs> I have to trust that she's speaking in Japanese, but we can do it in Hebrew, in Korean, and the classical ones, right? So this is the panel. This is the people that um, 
check the technology for months before giving us the feedback where an 88% of the users were totally in favor and a 12% uh, the, the remaining 12% very much in favor. This is implemented in Metro and bus stops in Barcelona and uh, in uh, 2,400 bus stops and 159 subway stations. It's uh, much more accessible for everyone. And uh, in the MIT review, they echoed this technology and they put this stickers um, around. So we are in the public transportation of New York. You can see it here in the signs. So a user in, uh, 20, min 20 meters away can find the bus stop and can get information in real time about the next lines that are going to go through there. And also we were introducing naval ends in, in different elements. We can see that they can identify where the bus uh, door is or the metro door is. So they can know where the next bus is coming. They can introduce a code of Netherlands in the in the door. They know if it's line uh, 35, 27, whatever line it is, the one that is right in front of them. So uh, you, can, you can check the, uh, the recordings in our web page. And if we also think about Netherlands with the idiomatic barriers, this is, for example, in a Germany, in, in a train in Germany, this is the uh, protocol, the COVID protocol in German. So many of us would have trouble understanding the instructions because we don't speak the language. Just by introducing the Netherlands code, you can get the information in your language. This is in Spanish, for example. So it is an audio recording for people with visual impairment. And it's also good for any user with the same information, with the same application, they can get information in their own language. So this is the technology that we are introducing in uh, customer service points to be able to uh, get oriented. And we are also um, integrating it with the ticket systems. This is uh, very good. Now, if we go to the way finding challenge, uh, look at the signs. So where's the city center? You could doubt, you maybe do not know. So this is an idiomatic barrier. So by introducing the same Netherlands code that helps people with visual impairment to know the signs with Netherlands Go, you can find um, this, you can find your way even though you don't have any impairments. So this is the experience that is uh, in the New York metro station. This is a, a train station in Spain. So you can point your cell phone towards the code and I am going to know uh, how in an intuitive way I can know my way around. So it doesn't matter if you have an impairment or not, you're going to get the information and you're going to be able to get to your, uh, to your destination. You can uh, go to, for example, if you're going to, to a soccer match and uh, it's in, in 30 more minutes, you don't have time to find your way around by yourself. So this app is going to tell you. You can actually have a sign, a sp special indications for a wheelchair users. So they tell you that you need to go around because the elevators that you can use are in the other way. So it, it shows you also that the Metro, the train that is getting is the train that you would need to take to go to the stadium. Same thing in Los Angeles, we introduced a naval lens and we know that any user can uh, get around with autonomy. The Oscars uh, were uh, held last year and we, had, we were there too uh, this year. So we have the codes right there and look there the pr the prime minister was there he was uh, driving the train uh, the spanish train but also he used the code to see how accessible it was so our objective is to help people with visual impairments so we put the signs for example on the 
on the road, on the floor, and we can help people know what are the different destinations that they have in the different intersections so they can make their minds there related to what they want to do. So you can walk around freely with uh, Nivellens and you're going to be able to get your gait. Uh, same thing with hospitals where we can uh, distinguish the bathrooms if they were for women or for men. And we have different museums. So we introduce Nivellens in the different cultural elements. We see people with uh, visual impairments where and they go to the museum. Uh, they have sign language available. They have pictograms as well, and they have re easy reading. So uh, any person with a, with a disability, they can get this information that is adapted to their preferred um, content and a unique code, multiple languages, visual, graphic, auditive, uh, pictograms, easy reading, um, uh, video in sign language. So just by introducing a Navalence code, any museum can introduce Navalence and any user is going to get the information. So this is the information about the painting that you're seeing. You get a description of what you're seeing. This is in the Museum of Japan, the Museum of Sands in Malaga. And this is the other examples that I gave you about the signs in Murcia. We had the same problem. So we created panels with a lot of sign signs that were very difficult to understand. So just by using a, a code, one of our codes, you can get to know around and you can move freely, receiving the same information that the users that can uh, see will receive. So we are including people with a visual disability to have uh, better accessibility. So you can download the school skit, um, so that any school can implement Netherlands at no cost. So this is a project that is the best one for us. Uh, Kellogg's has uh, chosen uh, us to introduce our codes in all of their packages. All of the packages in Europe will include the Netherlands code to help people with visual disabilities to get all of the information and to be able to, uh, to locate the package in the supermarket. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being here. And we're here before the pandemic without masks, but uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that in a while your signs will be more accessible too. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Raúl. Thank you so much, Raúl. It was a very good technology. It's a very good technology. What more can we say? You have surprised us. And we know that you will have a bright future with that. Without further ado, we are going to continue on with our third speaker, Jaisiel Madrid Sánchez from San Fim, who will share with us a little bit of the smart households and the technologies that they are developing. Hi, Ciel. Welcome. The floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Ricardo. Buenos días Thank a you todos. so much, Ricardo, and good morning and good afternoon from Spain. First of all, I want to thank Fundación Descubreme for your invitation, and I want to mention that I'm very happy to be able to share with you such important topics and my purpose with the presentation is going to be to share with you an overview regarding the work that you do at the SENFIM cluster with the Interiors Living Lab to promote using technology and social innovation to propose interior spaces that are more inclusive and especially adapted to the needs and preferences of all people. We are going to talk about the spaces where we spend most of our time, the interior spaces where we spend up to 90% of our life. Therefore, we are at all times in direct contact with interior design in all these spaces. In this context, with the purpose of our cluster, which is SENFIM, which is to activate collaborative work between people and the brands to define the different instances of the interior design, especially collective areas 
We already have over 140 companies and entities that share a strategy within the business chain of interior design. We have uh, furniture manufacturers and different manufacturers of, for instance, lighting fi fixtures and, uh, and other manufacturers that are somehow involved in this area. In this context, within the ecosystem of the cluster, whenever we talk about designing spaces, we like to say that this necessarily means to shape experiences and relationships within that space that connect emotionally with the customer or the user of the space. Therefore, it's not about creating a product or interior design that works or doesn't work. It's about creating a behavior or an emotional reaction in the person. So basically that it promotes emotional and physical well-being of the customer or the user of the space. And this is gaining relevance in time as more and more all the spaces for tourism as well as other spaces have understood that from interior design of their spaces, the design is a strategic tool or a vector for innovation in their business area in order to deliver a highly customized experience, especially with access for everyone. And just like Ricardo said it at the beginning of his presentation, this is something that requires from us to put at the core of our design, understanding the needs and uh, desires of people that we are designing the spaces for. Now, how do we trigger this type of design of products and spaces of interior design, which revolves around people with two key methodological elements? First, design thinking, which is a very well-known methodology and has been in the last decade in different sectors, and by which we put in the same room different voices of the sector in order to identify ourselves with the needs of the different types of customers of the hotels mainly, where we have design challenges that are highly specific for that industry. And we promote creativity to propose new interior design solutions. And secondly, we also use what we call evidence-based design. And with this evidence-based design, we obtain that the design of an instance does not finish when it is set up, but we continuously use technology to analyze the interaction and the experiences of people. And we measure how the interior design attributes have an influence over the emotion and the perceptions of people and ultimately over their, their well-being. With this, we are able to adjust interior design. So we are moving from a frozen or fixed interior design to a design which is alive, which is dynamic and ever-evolving. This is just a picture for you to see how the process goes. We use design thinking to feel more empathic, to create a new ideas and prototypes that we call concept rooms, which are physical instances of 60 to 70 square meters that we set up as a laboratory to analyze the needs that have been identified using different technologies to collect evidence regarding how efficient the design is. So the concept rooms serve as inspiration mainly for the hotel industry to incorporate conceptual innovations in their spaces that are also market trends at the moment and that will be the trends of the future. Many of those trends relate to safety, so the process does not stop there, but it continues on with the analysis of the space. Also, it is an ongoing project, so we continue using technology to analyze and measure the experiences. On the slide, just for you to have an idea, these are the companies that are part of our concept rooms. We have had eight hotel chains that are very important at the national and international level, eight interior design offices and over 60 brands that manufacture different products. Most of them also work internationally. The main inputs to promote this design thinking, we have analyzed the different uh, customers and visitors that are more related to each chain of hotels. And we have seen the innovations that connect with their needs. And we have figured out 
different types of customers with different needs of accessibility. And secondly, we have taken into account the daily operation of each hotel chain. And thirdly, of course, we have analyzed how certain trends that have been accelerated because of COVID-19 are having an impact and will continue to have an impact over our consumption habits and the configuration of all the interior spaces. I have listed here some interesting challenges that have to do with the technology and how to use it to promote more inclusive spaces, more accessible spaces, for instance, the growing role in improving the experience of the user in the hotel without over techni technifying the experience and also including this in a way that is not perceived so far away from any concept of providing uh, assistance beyond needed. So it is technology that offers this added level of uh, sensoriality in order to better offer inclusivity for people with special needs and also as an element that promotes comfort and luxury for any type of customer. It is also very important to highlight the role of technology, for instance, in the hotel industry to customize the attributes that may be available in this space in a very transparent and natural and subtle manner, which is not intrusive at all for the customer. Always highlighting the possibility of controlling from your own personal device certain features in a very accessible manner. Of course, all the options that are available for you. Also, we keep talking about multifunctional elements in the space. So the space changes as the customer performs different activities, for instance, in a hotel lobby or in a hotel room. Especially, it's important to facilitate technologies that would allow them to explore the environment, just like the technologies that were mentioned by Raul earlier with NaviLens technology. And overall, to have technologies made available to facilitate access to the information which is available. Now we see some pictures of this process of design and the work that we conduct with the hotel chains for interior design around the challenges that we have identified. And these are four concept rooms that we have set up in November 2019 in a hotel in Interi Hotel in Barcelona. Each concept room uh, responds to a set of uh, behaviors that we have uh, set up as a certain customer archetype that respond to the different customers that reach out to the hotel chains, all of them with different accessibility needs. So these are the four concept rooms that we have created in 2020 and that we are also going to show you in the new edition of Interi Hotel that will be held from the 24th to the 26th of November this year and you're all invited to attend. And as I said it earlier, once we have the interior design, the design does not end there for us. Rather, we continue to use technologies, specifically um, different sensors, so sensors that allow us to sort of characterize the efficiency of uh, the interior design, uh, looking at the changes in the perception, in the emotion, and in the behavior before the different uh, attributes of the design. And apart from looking at the reactions that are human reactions within the room, we are also using, as you can see on the screen, different technologies to have an accurate reference regarding the environmental attributes that we have at all times. For instance, lightning, the environment, the materials of the space, the uh, light, the shine, the te textures, the scents, everything. So at the end of the analysis, we sort of have a snapshot of what the space looks like, what type of behavior does it trigger in people. And as you can see, all of this can be put sort of on a dashboard. And with this, we are able to change the space in order to improve the efficiency. So we take a look at the changes, we put them in place, and we check whether we have improved or not, always looking at this source of objective data. And many of the metrics, of course, are referring to the needs of the space, for instance, where there are points of or points without any sort of reference for orientation, where there are physical barriers to access, et cetera, et cetera with information technologies that allow us to figure out how comfortable the different solutions are in that space 
And with this, I'm wrapping up. This is a way of working that we are not only using for hotels in Spain, but also in the retail stores, hand in hand with a new project which we are working on. And we're using the technologies that I have mentioned in order to redesign the interior design of the areas uh, where products are showcased in different areas of the stores in Barcelona. So this is part of the work that we conduct in the Living Lab cluster, which is part of the network of Living Labs, which is the International Organization of Living Labs. And we are also part of the European Initiative, which is a new European Bauhaus that includes inclusivity in spaces as one of the key elements in order to conduct new proposals, new interventions in the world of architecture and design. For those of you that want to find out more or if you want to collaborate with our cluster, this is my contact info. And without further ado, thank you so much to the organization. And once again, I'd like to give the floor to Ricardo. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Haisiel, por la excelente... Thank you very much, Haisiel, for your great presentation. Um, well, what can we say about all of the technologies and all of the applications that are very interesting that you're developing? Um, we are going to go to the questions for the panel. We have about 12 minutes for this part and to be able to really speak about things that are specific and that I wanted to ask. The first question goes to Raul. So Raul, I wanted to ask you, how have you thought that you can escalate your solution in Netherlands in other countries, maybe in countries that do not have all of this transport, public transportation, uh, systems as robust as the ones that you have shown. And um, maybe there are some countries where it wouldn't be that safe to carry out your uh, mobile phones in, in your hand, like especially for a person that has a visual impairment. What have you thought about this? Yes, thank you very much for your question. It's like three questions in one. <laughs> Well, first of all, we are working very intensely, as you have seen in, uh, with the presentation that uh, Nevelens is a global company that is in every place in the world. And we are working uh, every day, all day long. Um, imagine the time zones that we're working from Australia to the United States. So, um, well, and we have implemented uh, this system in Europe, in the United States, and in Japan. And in a little while, we will be in Australia as well. We will be able to announce it when it's official. So our efforts right now are related to incorporating Netherlands everywhere. We are uh, we have this incorporated in the science, and this is very useful for the people to, that do not know around. And that is what is good for. So the user is going to be able to just scan around and they're going to get the information and then if they think it's not a safe environment they can put it away but if we think about the places where enablement is introduced generally there are closed places where the security inside is is pretty well it's pretty good i mean it's established so a user with a visual impairment, they're just going to get the phone out once they scan around. It's like when you look around, same thing, and then they get the information. And from then on, they can uh, use their cane or their uh, or whatever reference they use, uh, and they are going to keep on receiving the instructions from the app. Thank you very much, Raul for your great answer. I I see that you have thought about everything. And well, I am sure that this, all of these things are going to work very well in all of the different countries. Now I'm going to ask a question to Haisiel. So Haisiel, out of all of the technologies and related to what you are doing, I wanted to know what kind or what other type of uh, technologic innovation are you applying to interior spaces that you think that could have a special impact 
for the inclusion of people with disabilities because we are seeing that what you are implementing what what it wants to do is to improve the experience of the user and we know that many times there are extreme users that have different tools to interact with the surroundings so do you have any specific innovation that is related to people with disabilities or with uh, maybe the elderly yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you for the question. And we have seen in the presentation that this line of work is more focused on um, external technology to uh, what we can see. But there's another line that we are developing, and it is in terms of how we can introduce technology in the equipment itself. So in a way, what we want to do is to make smart a piece of equipment so that through this proximity with the user, we can offer a great experience that is much more, um, that is much better. So we work with one of the clusters uh, companies and they're specialized in uh, doors and in blinds. And we have uh, developed a new I IoT product that allows to action to open and to close a door, a window um, based on the detection of presence in the in the place. So this door could be located anywhere. Now it's been implemented in in services in toilets to be able to facilitate the access of people with with um, reduced mobility. So this is automatic and uh, it has a presence detection. Another thing is the sofa, the smart sofa. This is something that we are developing with uh, the cluster and this is being introduced in the sensors. There are different sensors in in the sofas, in the exterior sofas, so that we can measure how ergonomic they are and how comfortable the person is uh, sitting on that sofa. Right now, we are taking it to other areas, but of course, it has many applications, for example, for surroundings such as the uh, work surroundings. So we started working with, with people and uh, they have some problems, for example, with uh, physical disabilities and it is hard for them to be sitting all day in a, on a chair so we need to control that and we need to make recommendations about the position and the ergonomy for the people that are using this solution so it is uh, very important to have this accessibility and in this case instead of having an external technology we would be, uh, we would have this embedded. So this is the type of internet of things technology. And it is important to say as well that with this type of technology in the physical pro products, we are making this physical products to be able to analyze the interaction of the users about the interaction with that product. This is very common in the digital world and we are used to interacting with our devices with different um, things and we are going to update. We are improving different, different things and this is being taken to the physical products. This supposes a change of paradigm that is very important because we are making these physical products that did not have any logic inside and that did not change. They were maintained in a static way so thanks to this smartness that we are introducing, we're able to um, to use this in a real way and we're able to propose new adaptations or new changes in the physical product that is there. It is a big change of paradigm. This is something that happens a lot in the digital world, but that in the physical world, it does not happen that much. It is always more complex, but uh, we are starting to um, make variations in this type of developments. So I think it's very interesting. 
in terms of accessibility mainly, right? Thank you. I think that this is a change of paradigm in terms of how to obtain data in any element. But we also need to offer these improvements. We need to improve the experience of the user. This is specifically more relevant. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, now we want to ask Seki about the technology without AI. This is a question that is similar to the one that I asked uh, Raul. So how have you thought about scaling this technology to other countries, thinking about um, difficulties that we could have that could be significant in terms of uh, occidental countries, uh, Western countries, so European countries and others. How do you think that you are going to do this? Great. So as you can see there, that's how one of our users is using seeing AI in his everyday life. Seeing AI is an iPhone app, so you can go and download that from the App Store, and it is available in Spanish, so um, that's great for the Latin America region. And one of my favorite parts of my job at seeing AI is talking to our customers and understanding their challenges. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, please do email us and I'll give the address at the end, seeingai at microsoft.com. And users have told us, for example, how a teacher has used it to recognize people, the students coming into the classroom. And we've heard it from people who are using it to independently read their mail or read documents for work or for education. We've heard from people how it's useful for them when they receive their groceries um, in the mail, they're able to tell the difference between two cans which feel the same, like tomatoes and beans, and makes a big difference. So they can use seeing AI to find which is which and put it away in the correct cupboard, or to get the instructions on how to cook a meal from the microwave, from the freezer. So these are just a few of the that people are using seeing AI. Also, understand the photos. We had one customer tell us about how he was sitting with family and going through the photos in his phone, and he was able to get descriptions. And while AI does not describe photos perfectly, it was enough for him to recall that memory to tell people about what was happening in the photo. And he could actually use our explore feature to run his finger over the glass screen and feel what was in the photo. That's really incredible. So if you're using Seeing AI, then please do share your stories too. The team is continuing to work on this. As I say, it's a conversation. So please do get in touch. And as we continue understanding what are the challenges that people all in the world have, what are the new areas we can tackle? And then at Microsoft, of course, we talk to the scientists on the cutting edge of technology to understand, you know, what's the latest evolutions? How can we bring this to our customers? There's so much more we have planned, and I can't wait to show you that in the upcoming months and years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there, undoubtedly, we are going to be paying a lot of attention. We are going to see how the scaling up goes. We are, I'm sure that we're going to be able to see this in many other countries. So, well, without further ado, I would like to just thank you, uh, thank all of the panelists. These technologies are really great, really useful, and they're very, very beneficial. 
to all of us and specifically that uh, I think that to people with uh, disabilities. So I wanted to thank the Foundation Descubreme and Zero Project Chile for the invitation to participate and to moderate this great panel. And well, I wanted to invite all of you to visualize this great session that I think it's going to be recorded and I have to share it as well. And we are invited to a new addition to a new event. I hope that you are healthy and you're well, and I want to read you from Spain and have a great day. Thank you very much.